Hello, it's Girl from a Girl and Her Librarian, and I have my librarian here. Say hello. Hello. <laughs> I'm going to apologise now. There's going to be a lot of giggling in this because he's in one of those moods today. So <laughs> we are here to have a chat about the Innkeeper series by Alona Andrews. So first question, what's the name of the inn? Gertrude Hunt. Gertrude Hunt. Isn't that just the worst name? Does it not just... I love Gertrude Hunt. I love the inn, but... No, think, think about it. This is a building in Texas that's been there for 150, 200 years. So it would have been built and named by the original settlers in the area. Okay, good point. Okay, so Innkeeper was being written by... Ilona Andrews. As we mentioned in our previous chats, Ilona Andrews is a pseudonym for a husband and wife writing team who actually do live in Austin. But they were going through a spate of other stuff and they thought for amusement and some interesting values, they would write a couple of chapters of an idea they were kicking around on their website. And they would do it almost as a short story in between a bunch of other things they were juggling because of various things happening in their life. And as they would write each uh, a single chapter each week, they would get their fans making comments in the comment section, seeing how it went and possibly reshaping some of the things from direct feedback from the fans. It then turned into slightly more than they expected because they didn't actually mean to write a full novel. It was meant to be a fairly short thing, but it turned into more. And because of the amount of fan appreciation it was getting and because of how much love it was getting, they then decided to gather all of those chapters together, re-edit them properly, and then release it as a Kindle. And then they did the sequel the same way, and just every single book so far, they have released the chapters for free as they've been writing them on their website and then reorganised it and sold it as a Kindle later. It is probably... One of the series I adore my librarian for, because you're the one who told me to read it. The first thing I love is Dina as the innkeeper. She's a bit scatty occasionally, and she's like, oh, dear God, I just need sleep and coffee. But then she is supremely powerful within the grounds of the inn, and nobody gets past her. Yeah. I mean, there was I can't remember which book it was in, but there was a vampire who had walked through, I think it was the second one where she has the peace summit, and he walks through and spits on the inn. Yes. And she warns him once. <laughs> it's like, And then other various, very scary creatures do things. And she opens an interdimensional door to a sea that's, I don't know, purple or orange or something stupid. And then there's this big sea creature and she says, I'll leave you in there for an hour or you're going to behave yourself. There's, there's no mucking about with her. She's just, yes. So we've yeah. got this wonderfully strong woman. I love her. It's this set up that the Earth is this natural hub of interstellar portals. Mm -hmm. So at some point in the distant past, all of the advanced races of the galaxy and the dimensions that did a lot of travel back and forth needed a place to meet. So they made a treaty stating that they would not reveal their reality to the majority of the humans and earth would be this neutral point so no one would invade it no one would show off flashy technology they would secretly arrive and spend and the inns that were around the planet could be used as safe neutral points for travelers and for meetings and various when you need to meet other people and sit down and have serious discussions and treaties each inn happens to be a seed that grows into a specific inn that bonds with a human. That human becomes the innkeeper, and within the inn, they can reshape reality, as it were, and open up portals to other places, depending on where the inn's particular seed has sprouted tendrils to. Yes. Very much that's, as they describe, it's like the Ysgard tree of Norse mythology that crosses multiple dimensions. Yes. Uh, the older the inn is, the more branches it's extended into various places in the universe and dimensional multiverse. It's the wonderful thing of bending physics because in the second book she has the red cleaver chef, uh, Oro, and he comes into the kitchen and he says, I can't, I can't work like this, there's, there's nothing here. And she opens the door to the pantry and it's like 
a thousand meters long and he looks at it and then he comes out and he closes the door and he looks at the thickness of the wall and then he opens the door again and he's like how what huh <laughs> and she's like i can you know physics doesn't kind of work here i can no, no. open yeah, all the windows it. on one side yeah. of the, the yeah. house yeah physics work there, there are rules to physics i like to consider them guidelines that can be <laughs> cut yes. not actual rules yes and then we have her resident um <laughs> yeah. resident caldenia mm. the wonderful well the thing about caldenia is is she's a murderer she's wicked she's a serial killer she's wanted she's hunted she's well, it, <laughs> yeah, well okay let, let's take us right so dina comes from a family of innkeepers she does at some point in the past she was one of three children and she wanted to have a normal life she comes back one day and finds that the, her parents and the inn that she had grown up and raised had completely disappeared. So she and her siblings were stuck. No one had any clue what had happened. No one could find any trace of her parents. No one knew what had caused it. They'd all split up to sort of try and track them down. After several years, she'd kind of almost given up hope and decided to come back. And she'd petitioned the innkeeper's assembly for an inn of her own. And they'd given her... Gertrude Hunt, which was mostly dead at the time and had mm. been abandoned for a long time. So she bonds with it, manages to coax it back into some form of health. But the inns are symbiotes and they kind of need guests with powerful magics because as long as they've got a guest, they kind of pick up this ambience of energy and it helps them grow and evolve. So an inn without a guest will die. Yes. And the one thing now, that she says in one of the books is that she walked around it and it was only because she saw the apple trees and how they were thriving that she knew that Gertrude, Gertrude Hunt wasn't dead, that she had some kind of hope. Yes. So, yes. So, Caldania, as you say, is not just a serial murderer. She was <laughs> a galactic tyrant. <laughs> she is a political beast, as it were, of vast knowledge, vast panache, a complete magnificent bastard. <laughs> As it were, she has taste and elegance. She plays the games of backstabbing and spies and assassinations and poisonings. As they sort of say, sort of like, you tried poisoning my uncle. And he goes, I tried poisoning everybody. I like them. <laughs> kind of thing. She is charming and creepy. Yes, and but you do fall in love with her. Yeah. She has her own principles. Hmm. With, with Caldani, you know exactly what she gets. She does not hide the fact that she is what she is. Yes. But because of various things that are never actually explained, her galactic tyranny, the worlds that she ran, something happened and she's no longer has those sources of power. She was on the run. Many countries, many nations, many powerful organizations want her dead. And she ended up fleeing to Earth. No other inn would accept her because of the sheer danger of having her as a guest. But because Dina needed a guest and she had no reputation as this was a reviving inn, she accepted Caldania as a lifelong guest. Yes. Under the conditions that if Caldania ever killed anyone, <laughs> even in self-defense within, <laughs> within the inn, her guesthood could be revoked. Yes. So she's, she's there on sufferance. She's there because Dina needs her. She becomes throughout the series, comes quite attached to Dina, I have to say. She's, She's the wise old aunt. She is, yes. She has tea every morning with Dina kind yep. of thing. Dina actually caused the integrate this small tower so they could have tea overlooking the neighbourhood. That's right. And this form of power, this being who controlled millions of lives, caused wars, caused mass death, eats fun guns. <laughs> drinks tea and gossips about the neighbourhood and the divorces that happen. Yes. It's, it's like she's just enjoying the soap opera of, of the neighbourhood. And and she, whenever something is about to happen, and Dina's like, I really shouldn't do this because I'll have to look after my guests. Caldenia is like, oh, no, it'd be fun. And then she sits back we and watches it. We have in the area in three weeks. <laughs> yes, exactly. And then you get these things. So we have... Um, they the taste lovely. <laughs> if you kill anyone on the ground, don't hide the body. Let's give it to the chef because they. If you do such and such, <laughs> it's particularly.
slightly disturbing when she does that, I have to say. The the first book is is where she meets Sean and Sean is there's dogs dying in the neighborhood and she runs out to a neighbor's dog who's been hurt and Sean is there and she knows he's a vampire, a uh, vampire, sorry. She knows he's a werewolf. I know I got it round the wrong way and I I do love my werewolves. And she says to him you're not dealing with this. Deal with this. This is your territory. You deal with this thing. So they're not quite sure what it is at the beginning, but they've got stalkers. Because the thing is, Sean doesn't know what she's talking about. No. Or rather, he's a werewolf that's moved into the area. Mm-hmm. He's a retired, but he's a former army guy. Yep. Who happens to be a werewolf who's moved in recently, recently who apparently doesn't know that she's an innkeeper. Yes. And doesn't know about other worlds. He hasn't got that far yet, bless him. But what he does start to do is to mark his territory. And she's not particularly happy that he decides to mark his territory all over her apple trees. And she calls him on it. And so you get this kind of push and pull between them where they kind of have, he's trying to help and then he doesn't quite understand what on earth is going on. He thinks she's just a, common civilian yes who somehow knows he's a werewolf and that kind of freaks him out a little bit and he interacts with her and you get that sort of play and pull as she's this mysterious girl who seems to know stuff Mm -hmm. you get the slow reveal of she's an innkeeper and what that means he gets the introduction to the wider world which is actually also an added way or a nice way for the authors to explain things to the readers yes so you have a mysterious being who's apparently doing stuff that's killing neighborhoods dogs and creatures and is possibly going to upscale this then rolls on to the arrival of some vampires who, again as dina explains to sean is they are not some undead mystical creature they are just a strange genetic offshoot of humanity that is very predator oriented and yes. they are a high-tech theocracy there's something very strange housing. about having a high-tech vampire in full sin armor i mean yeah. seriously yeah the reason the whole concept of the stake and me through the chest <laughs> yes because you literally needed this four foot stake to be able to get through that armor <laughs> and they have stasis chambers so that's where the coughing comes from so when they're regenerating or if they've been hurt they go into stasis chambers but you get arland who's well and first you get his uncle uncle sorin sorin gets hurt sorin gets hurt and then they rescue him because all of the companion vampires were killed Mm -hmm. they have to hide the body they rescue him he's an emergency medical aid but because of vampire armor they can't access him so they have to basically set off his alert that hadn't gone off and arland arrives who is the house marshal of (laughs) house crop he can be my house marshal anytime he likes because usually vampires win Usually I'm on the side of vampires. Well, I'm, I'm, just, I'm usually on the side of the werewolves, but Arland is, he's blonde, he's gorgeous, he's big, he's a vampire, he's technologically minded. He's basically your nobleman mm. knight. Yes. With that attitude. He is polite, he is courteous, he has the etiquette, he's charming. But as Dina says at one point, it's like, She's had a vampire kneel and gaze at her and offer poetry right before it tried to kill her and yes. rip her throat out with its fangs. That does kind <laughs> of upset you a little bit, yes. Yeah. I'd, I'd be so wary. The are also highly militant. The noble houses are geared around war. Yes. And being highly trained soldiers with nano-weave armour and monomolecular edged weapons and maces with force fields... <laughs> <laughs> to smash things there's a wonderful piece about him in um i think it's the last when he goes to oh when they it's the third book where they go to rescue maud um dina's sister and but he, story lines. <laughs> i know but there's a wonderful piece where he says i could just go outside and train so that i could scare some people who are watching the inn and he goes out and she gives him a rack of weapons and then he starts throwing weapons around and sweating everywhere because, you know, I'm a grr vampire and I growl at things. And But he's also very cute. If you think, actually, Arland is basically Henry Cavill in The Witcher. Yes. 
if yes. you think about it. Yeah. So that's probably part of the appeal for you, is he's got that look and he, he's got that bulk and that look and then he handles the weapons and swings and dances and does all of that Except approach. We do have an issue where he's staying at the inn and he comes down and Sean gives him coffee. And Dina says, oh, please tell me you didn't give him coffee. And Arland is then drunk. Sean doesn't know this is the no. effect of coffee. He just thought it's giving a man coffee. However, to vampires, mm. drinking a cup of coffee was basically the same as drinking a bottle of hardened whiskey. Yes. So he goes frolicking about the grounds naked. I have to say, I would have been with Caldania and had a cup of tea and watched Sean Dina try to go out like, and get him. Sean, catch the naked vampire. <laughs> it's your fault. <laughs> I don't think the name is sick. And therein comes the fact that you can have the most heartfelt situations in the innkeeper, but you can also have the funniest one-liners and the funniest little incidences between everything. You've got Arlen, who's this amazing warrior, house marshal. You know, he's courting the girls. He's winking at all the, the, the beauties. And then he freezes for a multisecond in the middle of battle because he sees Dina's sister basically being a swordswoman. And he's like, oh, my God, who is that girl? And you think, it's just like, seriously, this whip of a girl has just made a huge vampire stop and think for a second. Because, yeah, he's he's very sweet. I do love him. Well, you've got the fact that Arland has that whole, because he's the marshal, because he is such this high-powered position, he's used to women throwing themselves at him. <laughs> so he has that whole, he will kind of be courteously flirty. Yes. Without being anything more. So it's almost kind of, he's got that defensive routine to not get involved because of all of the political implications. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so so the first book has this Dina meeting Sean, meeting Arland, the explanation for everything, this strange being that's potentially going to cause a disruption to the treaty because it's mm-hmm. killing people in public. And you get this story of assassination and blackmail and Arland's there to hunt down the killer of his aunt and find out why... It was trying to frame this other party at the wedding. Mm -hmm. Sean's getting caught up because it's his territory. And Dean is there as the innkeeper just trying to make do. And you get Sean and Arlen kind of both suddenly finding out there's this interesting human woman (laughs) with all sorts of strange things. It's showing them interesting sights and reacting to them in ways that they do not normally have people react to them. Yes. And you also have that point where they're walking across the thingy and they're both kind of standing off with each other because they both want the girl and Arlen says suck it up werewolf the vampire always gets the girl yeah well yeah you get that right they they kind of do the end of the story you get that step up they have that conversation you get Arlen looks at Sean and does the whole right yes I've I've studied the literature of this world (laughs) when a werewolf and a vampire go the vampire gets her kind of thing (laughs) I'm afraid I'm with Ireland on that one, that, that I would actually probably go with him. Although it's very, I mean, they she takes him to Baha which is where all the merchants are, and where she gets all of her weaponry from. It's like a... A vast intergalactic trading hub of a city that's all portals yes. to everywhere. It's like, if you can't buy it in Baha you can't buy it yes. anywhere. She... It's the vast melting pot. She goes to see, is it Wilmos? She goes to see Wilmos and he recognises well, Sean. She, she goes to see Niswan, Ni, Niswan the oh, merchant. Of course she does, yes, yes. Because she needs to buy some extra weaponry. And on the way there, they pass a weapon shop that happens to be run by another werewolf who recognises Sean mm-hmm. as a specific breed, an alpha werewolf. It's very sad. This is where, this is one of the things I liked about when, she, and... when Dina revealed the story to Sean of where werewolves actually come yes. from. Yes, yes. That, you know, they're, they're not from Earth, that, that his parents haven't totally told him the whole story and he has that conversation with his parents. But he also has that thing where Wilmos is basically, you are my life's work. We didn't expect what we had engineered to have offspring and for them to be like this. And he's got some armour in the corner of his, his shop and it's calling to Sean and he says, well, they were made for you. And then you get this. One of the things I 
do like in certain books is that you don't have a couple jumping into everything and forever after immediately. You know, Sean has suddenly realised I'm not from Earth. I don't know who I am, where I've come from, what I am. This and girl then, has power and she's showing me the universe. Yes. And I don't have anything and I don't know what's going on. So at the end of the first book is where he leaves. He goes to he goes to work for Wilmos. He owes him a favour for the for the armour and for all of the information. But you see her and it's the first time you hear her say, as an innkeeper, the guests always arrive and leave, but I never do. And she's always mm. saying goodbye to guests. So Arlen goes when everything's finished. You've got Sean leaving and then it's just her and Caldania again. Yeah. And it's, I kind of appreciate that she's not already hooked up with somebody in the first book, that it's kind of more of a long haul yeah. um, for it. It's one of those ones where you could, because if you think about it, you had, when Sean kind of discovered that she was more than a civilian, mm-hmm. when he tried getting in the inn and she used the inn's magic to basically keep him out and then catapult him into the apple trees. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and that whole reveal. And do and you have it? It's done with quite a humorous tone, mm. and you get that back and forth banter, and then you kind of get Dina turns around and and sort of realizes that Sean knows nothing about who werewolves actually are. Yeah, he's been one his entire life. His parents are werewolves, but they've never told him. Mm. He doesn't know about innkeepers. He doesn't know, and she turns up and she does this, and it suddenly goes from this humor back and forth to this emotional tragic backstory of the fact that. The werewolves were artificially created to defend their planet from invasion. Yes. And it ended up with them having to create an alpha breed as a last line of defense while the entire planet was evacuated and then destroyed. Yes. yes. So the werewolves are the sort of remnant population that survived, that man- were managed to get evacuated. And yes, they are werewolves and they are savage because they designed themselves to be savage to defend themselves. But before that, they were poets and artists. Yes. Mm-hmm. It's a different story from where you, you, you're you used to hearing werewolves coming from. And as you transition into, I think it's Sweeping Peace is the second one, you have George coming along who is an arbitrator. He's asking her to have a peace summit that nobody else wants to touch. Interesting thing. If you, if you think about it, when they were in the first book, when they're going through the Hachar, you get that description of the people they're passing. Yeah. And you get Sean mentions that they sort of see this group of three. You have a charming guy with a cane and a bird on his shoulder and a, someone next to him who has a vague family resemblance. Yes. Who's moving in a much predatory manner. Oh. That's George, that was George. George, Jack and... Gaston. Gaston, that's it, Gaston. Yeah. And also those three characters, if you remember what I mentioned... They are the ones that were actually from the On the Edge series. Yes. They were they were children in Elena Andrews's On the Edge series. I'm gonna have to go and read it because I'm I'm there's something tragic and wonderful about George. So George so they have a small piece at the beginning of the book that is George being offered a position to basically go and help negotiate and yeah. kind of huge pieces. Yeah. George's got... backstory is the fact that at the age of 27, 28, yeah. he had basically become the Cardinal Richelieu yes. of his nation. He was the spy master eminence who protected yeah. his nation. He was a master manipulator, mm-hmm. confidence. He was his own brand of magnificent bastard. Yeah, and he's but bored. Is, yeah. He also, he has that, but he does it with empathy. Mm. Because he is so concerned about people. So because he has empathy, he is willing to do some very twisted rebellion yes. plots and kill people. But at the same time, because of that, he's hurting himself because he's very much aware of who he's doing it to and yes. what, what sort of things he's causing. It's a strange one because the one thing I loved was you've got the holy anocracy are part of it. You've got Nexus. Nexus is the planet they're all trying to mine. You've got the merchants on the sea merchants on there. They're trying to keep hold of their section. You've got the hope crushing horde, uh, yeah. the Carnu, uh, cartoon, car, uh, I can't say it with the with the Carnu. Carn- but she's one of the. They I, send it, her Majesty the um, the Queen. Carnu comes to the 
thing is uh, for the crushing horde you've got the holonianocracy holonianocracy with the vampires and then you've got the merchants i don't like the merchants i don't like nuancy yeah. it, it he drives me insane i just want to clip him around the ear um, uh, yeah it's it's that the merchants are this kind of almost they are this small predatory species that mm. look almost something like a cross between a fox and a cat Yes, which is and disturbing. Everybody te- and everybody thinks they are these nice, cute, funny things. But they have survived on a world that's... They, they have evolved on a world that's very dangerous. Yes. Because they can outwit and outthink. And they are assassins par excellence. Yes. and But they have moved all of those instincts onto the nature of being merchants. Yes. The whole story going through where they're all getting a bit fed up. The Hope Crushing Horde can't can't kind of talk to the vampires the vampires thing and and then you get kind of a stuck in the middle but then you have made worse by the fact that nexus despite this planet with the battles is a has a weird dimensional thing going on yes so the high-tech tools can't be used yes and the time runs weirdly so for a single month that passes you're actually kind of anyone in the planet's field actually exists for like three or five months. Yes. Yeah. And this war has been going on for decades. So anyone involved in that war has literally spent decades fighting yeah. in it, where the only tools are your basic swords and maces and Yes. And considering the vampires come from such a high tech thing. They all have high tech, so it's kind of like anything that is not a sort of fatal injury to begin with you get taken off from the battle and you'll be healed pretty much overnight and then you're straight back into the bloodshed again yes it's a heartbreaking book more than any of the others is the one that makes me cry at the end because at some point dina realizes she goes and has tea with the kanum she's got her son there but one of her sons has already died on nexus and she's already lost him and to her, it's just generation after generation after generation. And Dina's like, I have to stop this. And she wants to give her her autumn ceremony. But then she has to get the vampires yeah, to agree to it and Nuancy to agree to it. So you have all the shenanigans in the middle. It's like everybody realises there needs to be a peace treaty. Yeah. But because of the amount of people and history and the deaths yes. involved, no one is like willing to sort of say, look, we've lost so many people. How can we just accept Yes, this. you can't just stop. We you can't have to avenge, stop. yeah. We have to be, it's not just the avenge, it's like we need something to show that they didn't die in vain. Yes, it wasn't just for nothing. So you have, the arbitrators have been called in to try and arrange a peace treaty. Yep. Again, it's a situation where no other inn would be willing to do it because the, the vampire house, not the, the an- 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 anocracy, I can never say that name. The holy anocracy. The Holy Anocracy is one of the big movers in the galaxy. The Hope Crushing Horde is another big mover. They, I mean, they are the Hope Crushing Horde. Yes, I love that name. Yeah, but the thing is, it's like the vampires are noble houses, very autocratic with the theocracy. Hope Crushing Horde is meritocratic, egalitarian, almost sort of genetic engineering. Everyone is develops themselves into a very specific role. Yes. And the merchants are the merchants. They are trying. I mean, you get the fact that it comes out later that Nuancy is there for a reason. Mm-hmm. And the vampire houses rotate through to represent who's on Nexus at a time. And yep. for various reasons, it's House Kra, which is why we get Ireland back. And which is also added reason for when none of the other inns are willing to hold the... Yes. Treaty, he's like, hang on, I happen to know an innkeeper that... If anyone starts reading the series, the first book is pretty much a setup. It's pretty much a kind of getting you in there. The second book is where it really does pull at heartstrings in a terrifying way sometimes. But you also have the way that she resolves everything is you've got someone tries to poison her. You've then got somebody wants to bring guests. So House Kra makes a mistake they bring in someone they shouldn't and then you've got and then you've got the you've got things where george is his controlling yes arbitrator self who's set things in motions and the expectations that people will respond in certain ways and then but we don't want to leave too many spoilers no <laughs> nuancy brings in turinadine who was fascinating to me absolutely fascinating it's you get 
part of the build up with the merchants is that they don't have they aren't the warrior states no, they don't have an army the inocracy is that the hope crushing horde are however because they are the merchants because they have so much vast wealth they have mercenaries a lot of them mm-hmm. and they can pay mercenaries enough that they are willing to come to nexus and fight and potentially die but they have this general who is a mythological figure yeah. who cannot be killed who always appears in this strange armor and hood that no one knows what they look like mm-hmm. they've been there and yeah the third book is another one where she kind of takes on that kind of thing that she shouldn't again she kind of she's got someone in her in she's like i want to save you i don't want you to be wiped out i don't but But you realize again in the first book one of the reasons she gets involved Mm. was because someone threatens her in someone stands on her doorstep and threatens her yes and she does that she doesn't like that she doesn't like that and again in the third book She's been asked to do something that potentially puts her in and the guests in danger that she doesn't want to do. She wants to help them, but she knows that in weighing the balance, it's too much of a risk. Mm-hmm. And then someone stands on her doorstep <laughs> and her. Yeah, and she does not. Like, right, we are helping you. Yeah. <laughs> you she, are not. <laughs> it's an immediate turnaround with her. And so, I mean, I really enjoyed that. But the one, the, the book that I was really looking forward to was the fourth one, which is where Arland and her sister Maud, yeah. who they'd rescued in the because third again, book. Slow build up in the first and second book. Yes. Where they she'd gone out to hunt her parents with her siblings. Her brother had carried on saying he wouldn't come home until he found them. Yep. What they don't know is that he's become an arbitrator. Once you take the role of an arbitrator, you are not allowed to return to your home planet for twenty years. Yes. And her sister had ended up being being married to a vampire in a very minor house in the back mm-hmm. of beyond and she hadn't heard from her and it's that whole you lose track of people who marry and move out of your life mm-hmm. <laughs> even if they're family <laughs> <laughs> and, and things going on so you had that and then the third book opens up basically with the sort of the general catch-up of how life had been since the impossible treaty had mm-hmm. gone on and then she receives a note saying from her sister going here are my coordinates please help me yes the thing about the third book is there was a wonderful interaction between Maud and Arland and Maud's got a little girl as well but the the back and forth between the two of them I was like I cannot wait for their book to come out and then the fourth book came out and there was a lot in it she goes to his home planet she meets his family that's the thing with the fourth book is that it's not technically it's the it's an innkeeper book, but it's not about the inn. Yes. You don't really have anything about Dina. You have it's Maud and Arland. Yes. Because Maud Maud is a human who can out vampire vampires. Yes. Which is is just she's brilliant and I love her and I love the interaction between her and Arland because Arland is like a teenage boy who doesn't quite know what to do with himself. As much as I loved the book There was a lot of intrigue in it. There was a lot of back and forth in it. There was a lot of stuff going on, but not enough between her and him. That was part of it because Maud has that whole, I've been married to a vampire. Yeah. He screwed up big time. We got banished and then he screwed up again and got killed, leaving me with our daughter. Yes. On this back of beyond planet Mm. that we were exiled to. Yes. She's very much, I am done with vampires because of the way I was treated. I worked hard, so I was capable. And then the moment bad things happened, I was not looked at as my value as my own. I was purely my husband's appendage. But she knows she is in love with Ireland. Mm -hmm. So she wants to sort of figure out what's going on, but she doesn't want to be part of his house or become someone's wife again. So she goes to Ireland's homeworld. She has that whole expectation of, Things are going to be rough and Arland wants to be there and help her. But because of all of his duties and everything else that's going on, they constantly keep having the time song away. Yes. So you get that stress of they're trying to find their place with each other, but they can never get time together. That's a very specific aspect to Which is ironic because when he rescues her, when he helps Dina rescue her and they come back to the inn, he says to Dina, um, I want a room. I, I, want, I want to be. And she goes to him. I thought you were going like home, House Marshall. And he goes, nope, I have had enough of the rigours of um, thingy. I need a sojourn. 
I'm having a sojourn. I can't say it. Sojourn. Sojourn. And, sojourn. And she's like, what? Really? I'm having a rest. I, I need a rest yeah. and relaxation. My, my uncle will understand. And you got his attendant going, my lord. So he goes, yeah. And, she, she, and Dean is also like, your uncle, your uncle, Soren? Really? Yeah. And he goes, yes, under that gruff exterior. Peaceful, <laughs> passionate heart. And you can have his attendants there going, um, so, yeah, are you sure? Surgeon Soren? <laughs> <laughs> Warm what? and compassionate? <laughs> It is probably one of my favourite series and having Arland throughout all of the books has been really nice. Having Sean in and out through the books and where he ends up through the books as well. Having Caldania in the inn and How the Red Cleave Oro. You need to get something from his body, but you don't know where it is. I once <laughs> had to get something from someone who stole something from me. He had many internal pockets in his body, so I boiled him. <laughs> Like, and, and, and you get that pause it's like that whole of course the person you're trying to search is already dead you won't have the annoying screams oh yes oh god I, remember. <laughs> I had to read that three times before I was I, I just I was shocked and then I couldn't stop laughing and then I was shocked a bit more and a bit more scared of Caldania yes it's Caldania has that whole she's very good at the advice she gives yes and it's almost she intentionally says things that are very disturbing yes and she has very knowing... sharp teeth yeah, she's very sharp, but she says things that she knows others will find disturbing in a way to make them think yes. about the things that she, the advice that she's giving. Yes. If she gave it just as normal advice, it wouldn't have the same effect. But because she gives that advice, yes. but always with that slight. They're still thinking about it an hour later and it's still kind of filtering in. So, in my opinion, it's probably one of the best series that I've come across. And I look forward to more of them. If you start reading them, you have to start from the beginning because otherwise you kind of get a little bit lost in the middle about how things work and about where Sean comes from, where Arlen comes from, where all of the kind of bits and pieces come from. So how many times have you read the series? I couldn't say. <laughs> it, it's, no, no, it's, uh, yeah, because I'm trying to think because Clean Sweep, I mean, I think the first, yeah, so Clean Sweep, they released as Kindle available back in 2013. Okay. So it's basically been seven years, I believe. So, yeah, I, I've read them multiple times. I've read, <laughs> Over years. I've read them twice, three times, actually. Uh, I've read three times up until the second one, and I'm halfway through the third one again. I was trying to get to finish them, but I remember more, the one with Morden Ireland I only read last year. So yeah, um, they yeah, that got released only a short while ago. Yes, would recommend them to anybody, and right. I will leave everybody to that. And if you have any comments or questions about Innkeeper, speak to the librarian because <laughs> he remembers a lot more about books than I do. Yes, thank you ever so much for joining us. And yeah, I will say pleasure. Bye.